Good morning. I had that camera on they were talking about during the lectureship. It must be an optical illusion. When I look down at it, it almost looks like I got a bald spot on my head. I don't know. <laughs> Something wrong with that thing. <laughs> Good morning and welcome this morning to the Bremen Church of Christ. We're thankful for your presence here for our morning Bible study period. We're going to begin this morning with number 219, 219. We'll sing all three verses of this song, and then we'll be led in our scripture reading and prayer before we dismiss to our classes. Let's sing out together. Turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, Luke chapter 9, 57 through 62, New American Standard Reading. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes, the birds have the air have nests, birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. And another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time that you have spared our lives to, that we can come and study your word. I pray as we prepare our minds for this study that we'll we'll allow the, the word to mold our life and to become a better servant of yours, knowing that that's what we're to do, to grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son. Father, we are thankful for the teachers that have prepared lessons, and we pray that you'll bless them with the things that they have prepared. I pray that you'll be with us as hearers to uh, listen attentively so that we can grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, we welcome you this morning. We're thankful for everyone's presence on this lovely Lord's Day. We do have visitors among us this morning. We want you to feel welcome here and come back any time that you have an opportunity. We'll dismiss now to our classes, nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes first. Middle school, high school, and adult classes are dismissed.
Well, it is good, as Johnny said, to see you here this morning. We are studying in this class, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we will continue that study this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> we had gotten down into verses 11 and 12 in our study last Lord's Day, <clears throat> our Two weeks ago, actually, lectureship was last Lord's Day. And we've noted that there are three words in verses 11 and 12 that certainly need to be heeded as every other word in the Scripture. But notice those words, flee, follow, fight. How much more do we need that today than when Paul wrote it to Timothy back when. Of course, Timothy had been left in Ephesus to, number one, prevent uh, those in Ephesus from teaching some other doctrine than the gospel of Christ, and we've noted that several times in this book, how he talks about sound doctrine, sound words, wholesome words, all of those expressions to let us know that there is a standard that God has given that must be followed and nothing else. You remember the statement that Paul made to the churches of Galatia, chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. He said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he basically repeats that in verse 9. There is no other gospel, there is no other message that is beneficial to the soul of man. That's why even within this book, Paul refers to it as wholesome. It's good for the soul. Anything else is dangerous to the soul. And so Timothy is there to try to prevent anything else from from being taught and at the same time to encourage those brethren in Ephesus to live their lives in harmony with that word. Now as they do that, there are some things that they have to flee. And that's what we've already noted in verse 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. What things? Can't hear you. No, we don't flee wholesome doctrine. We stick to that. Unwholesome doctrine, all right. But in this particular context, he's just got through talking about the connection of material things. What's more important, the things of this world, material things, or things of a spiritual nature? And yet, what is it that most folks are focusing on today? The material, the material. Seeing how much more now, we've already discussed in those preceding verses that there is, there's nothing wrong with material things in themselves. But when they become our God, when they become our idol, when they become our major focus in life, then they have become a problem. And so, <clears throat> rather than, than focusing on those things, he says, flee these things, and follow. This is about where we left off last uh, two weeks ago. Follow after some things. And he lists them. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. <clears throat> Can you think of any other similar list in the scriptures? All right, Christian graces. Second Peter chapter 1, <clears throat> beginning... In about verse 5, add to your faith. What are they? In order. Virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience. (laughs) 
godliness, then brotherly kindness, then love, charity. All right. So you've got another good list there. Can you think of any others? What? Fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses uh, uh, 22, 23. Love, joy, peace, so forth. And so there are these lists. And I've often said, and especially looking at, at texts like these, <clears throat> for the benefit of those among us who say, well, I just, you know, I just don't really have anything to do. Well, what about trying to improve your life by adding these things to your life? It'd be a good place to start, wouldn't it? And uh, the more we add these things to our lives, the more spiritual we become, the more uh, godly we are. And so uh, here are some things that we are to follow. Here's the direction. Here's the course. <clears throat> we often talk about the Christian race. For example, we are taught to run with patience the race that is set before us. And, and we, Roger, you've never preached this, have you? <clears throat> Here's a good sermon. You know, I bet you've preached as many times as I have. <clears throat> the idea of if you're going to run the race, there, there are so many similarities between the, uh, any physical race that you and I might run today and the spiritual race. There's preparation. There's a starting point, there's a finish line, there's a particular course to be run, there are various rules that must be followed in order to expect to run, complete the race, and then to receive the award at the end of the race. So it is spiritually. There's a place to begin, there's a course to run. We, we can't just run anywhere we want to run. But God has given us the direction. And so when he talks about here uh, following after these things, there's, there's a specific course of action that is to be followed. So look at that list of things. Follow after righteousness. Uh, this certainly would be the idea of being consecrated to God. Give me a simple definition of the word Righteousness. Right doing is about the simplest explanation or definition that you can come up with for the word righteousness. Right doing. Doing what's right according to that standard, that wholesome doctrine, the Word of God. It is to be our standard. Uh, in um, <clears throat> the Roman letter, chapter 12 and in verse um, uh, 20, <clears throat> 21, you notice he says, Be not overcome of evil. Well, what is, what is Paul dealing with here in 1 Timothy? Fighting against unwholesome doctrine, against ungodly lives. But overcome evil with what? Good. You may recall in the prophecies of Isaiah, Isaiah described a condition to which people can go spiritually, and he uses these two words, good and evil. Do you remember what he said? Using those two words. One of them that call Evil, good, and good, evil. They don't seem to know the difference. That's a sad state of affairs spiritually, isn't it? For people to reach a point in their lives, and, and he wasn't talking about people out here who had never met God before. He was talking about his own people who had reached the point spiritually. They seemed that if they knew the difference between good and evil, they did not make that distinction. We must do better than that. So there is that uh, man <clears throat> who is consecrated to God. Righteousness, godliness. 
All right, give me a good simple definition of godliness. God likeness. Striving to possess the characteristics, the attributes, as much as humanly possible, of God. Allowing Him to be our pattern. There are several passages that instruct us to, to follow God. Let Him be our lead. Let Him be our guide. And so, here is one who, who knows, who who understands the right way. Incidentally, that little phrase, follow after, suggests a couple of, a couple of words or phrases that we might use in our day, <clears throat> is to chase. What does that suggest to you? Putting forth some effort? It's not something that you can just casually do. Another phrase, by definition of that phrase, follow after would be to pursue. And again, it, it suggests the idea of, of dedication and, and commitment and, and effort on our part to have or follow these things, pursue these things. Now, that would suggest to us that, that Christianity is not a hit and or miss situation. It's something to which we dedicate ourselves, something, something that we are continually going after. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith. Well, if we are consecrated to God and we are trying to be God-like, that's going to be manifest, is it not, in our faith. What does faith cause us to do? <clears throat> and I'll give you a little bit of a hint. Hebrews 11. Does that give you a hint? What will faith cause us to do? By faith, Noah moved. Moved. Faith will cause us to move. Faith will cause us to do something. It'll cause us to follow God, won't it? Yes. <clears throat> exactly. In um, in uh, First um, Peter chapter one, beginning in verse uh, <clears throat> three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, how? Through faith, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Then he goes on to talk about some other things. But that idea of faith moves us to action. We sing a song occasionally. Faith is what? The victory that overcomes the world. When you see people who are being overcome by the world, what's the problem? Their faith is not what it needs to be. They need to have a stronger faith. Stronger faith. Then follow after what else? Love. How would you characterize love? <clears throat> what? Concern, long suffering. The godly love is knowing the best or the object of. All right. When we say that we love somebody, 
We're in essence saying we are willing to seek the best for that person. The best. So that's going to remove selfishness, isn't it? Going to get self out of the way. Of course, that's, that's one of the first things the Lord taught His disciples. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Get, get self out of the way. There's, there's no place among God's people for selfishness. Well, you know, as you begin to, to pinpoint these various words that you pinpointed, that ought to kind of lead you to a certain passage of Scripture. What would it be? Great love chapter of the Bible. Huh? 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4, Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Somebody in our, in our lectureship, and I appreciated the point that they made in that regard, the King James says is not easily provoked. The word easily is not in the original. Is not provoked. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And then that little summary statement, love never fails. Now, again, when you think about that list, how many of us have different points relative to the nature of New Testament love? How many of us, how many of us have areas there where we could do a little bit of work on ourselves? If we're honest, all of us. I mean, there's no, there's no point of, of saying, well, I have reached the ultimate degree of any of that. There's always room for improvement in our lives. And so, you want something to do? Follow after love. That'll keep you busy for a while, won't it? Follow after patience. So, in addition to that compassion... There is that um, constant duty of, of patience. What does the word patience generally mean in the Scriptures? <clears throat> the idea of, of willing to endure, long-suffering. You see, that, uh, that idea of, of patience is actually a state of mind that enables one to, to face the difficulties that we'll face as children of God, and remain faithful in the process. What difficulty were these folks facing in Ephesus? I mean, you, you, you think about uh, Goddess Diana being there, and we've mentioned that several times in this letter, uh, how much of an influence the followers of that goddess had in that city and so those who would, who would denounce that idolatry, that paganism, began to live a faithful Christian life in such contrast to that way of life would not be received with a great deal of, of joy. And then you've got wherever, and, and this is evident in reading of the journeys of Paul, almost without exception when he went into a city, what was one of the first things he faced? Judaizing teachers who were trying to create a problem would ultimately lead to persecution toward him and those who, who would follow him. And so there, there's, there's trouble on every hand. The efforts of the uh, Roman government to subdue Christianity. So these folks faced a lot of difficulties. But if we're going to be faithful children of God, Paul says to Timothy, you need to teach these people. And of course, this would be beneficial to Timothy because of the work that he is there to do. He's going to need a lot of patience, isn't he? How many of us have reached the ultimate degree of patience? <laughs> uh -uh. No, no, no. So we've got to be able to endure but somebody says, well, you know, that's, that's, back in, you know, that's back in the first century and, 
we don't we don't have to deal with with persecution today, so we don't have to worry about patience. Maybe we forgot what Paul wrote to Timothy later on. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus just might somewhere along the way possibly. No, 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 no. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, I would be the first to admit that the degree of persecution that we face here, for the most part in our country, doesn't even begin to compare with the degree of persecution that these brethren in Ephesus would have faced. But still, Paul says, if we are living godly, we shall suffer persecution. What forms of persecution do we suffer today locally? What's the worst we might suffer? Public ridicule. Somebody might make a snide remark about the degree of your faith and the intensity of your religious activities. They might call you a fanatic. They might choose that, you know, just to not have you in their circle of friends. I mean, how many of us have had rocks thrown at us? How many of us have been beaten because of our Christianity? It doesn't happen. Now, there are parts of the world where persecution still reigns pretty heavily, but not here. So what do we have to fear? You know, I think, I I really believe this. Our greatest fear as Christian people in this part of the world, and, and I think oftentimes causes us not to be as firm in our convictions as we ought to be, is that we want people to like us too much. We want everybody to like us. I think that's our greatest fear. If we speak up, if we, we take a stand, we might, we might lose a friend. Somebody might not feel as close to us as they once did. They, they might think a little negatively about us. Folks, if that keeps us from speaking up for the cause of Christ, we're in sad shape. Our faith is extremely weak. And yet I see it happen. It doesn't begin to compare with what our brethren suffered, much less what our Lord suffered. Roger, you had a... I just think that in the the country of Sweden, the preacher got up and read the first chapter of Romans. They sentenced him to four years in jail because of being against homosexuality. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there are... That's right. And we don't hate people, we hate sin. But if you speak anything against it now, you're guilty of hate, and we're going to suffer some persecution. You won't be able to preach against it unless you go to jail. That's right. I, I made the comment to Ann, we were talking about some things just, just this past week that I, I hope it doesn't happen this rapidly, but I would not be surprised if I live a normal lifespan that in my lifetime. I don't see changes taking place that will greatly alter how we in the church have to do things. I mean, it's going downhill so fast. This country is so far. I mean, it's still 
in my opinion, it's still the greatest place on the face of the earth to live, and I'm not saying that. But things are deteriorating so rapidly. And the direction that we are seeing, and as Roger said, some of the things that, that uh, some of our government officials and those who want to be our government officials are promoting shows no value of life whatsoever. And that's scary. That's scary. You know, I, and I probably shouldn't even bring this up because I don't want to get in a major discussion of it. But in, in, in a study of the book of Revelation, if I understand that book correctly, it's relative to a time when the Roman government under the ruler Domitian, around the A.D. 90 to 100 period, was persecuting the Lord's church unbelievably. And if you read some of that history and, and the ways they were persecuting the church and, and uh, the beast that was involved uh, and, and the devil being involved. And, and then you read on, and, and I, think, I think the major message of the book is to those brethren in Asia Minor, you just hold out, because this is not always going to be the case. There, there's, an, there's an end coming to this for them, shortly come to pass. But at the same time in that book, you'll recall that The devil is bound for a period. My understanding of that is that the devil will not be allowed to persecute the church in the way that he was persecuting at that point. It doesn't say that the devil is bound and, and not active anymore. But he's just not able, at least for a time, to use a national government to persecute the church like, he's, like he was doing then. But then if you'll read on, you'll find that he's going to be released for a little season. Now, I don't know about you, but if I understand Revelation, folks, that scares me to death. It scares me to death. To think that, that in this world, and it might be in our own country, that the government would be so oppressive against the Lord's church. Now, here's the question. We allow so little insignificant things to hinder us from worshiping and serving God now. Where will we be if it gets to the point of it being a situation of costing us our life if we are found assembling to worship God? Where will I be? I believe. Go ahead. What well, we did here. Persecution. Somebody tells me I can't do something. We just that bullhead. Yeah. It's like our children. You know, you can't do that. Well, look out. They love to try. And that might be the very thing that will, will eliminate some of the apathy, some of the indifference that we're seeing in the Lord's church today. That's true. But I, th I, think, I think we are facing some very perilous times. And I don't think it's going to get any better for a while. Now, I don't mean to be a... You know, proclaim I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but but when you look at the direction of things relative to past history, folks, we're headed in a collision course. If something doesn't happen to turn it around, and and God's people better be on their knees, better be on their knees that that doesn't happen. How did y'all get me off on that? I think it's a good detour. <laughs> It, I, I think it's I think it's something we need to we need to consider. All right. So there is that there's that patience. That's oh that, that's how we got there. We were talking about patience. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Then um, follow after meekness. Well, that means that we're to be a weak, spineless people, right? Oh, you mean weakness and meekness is not the same? No. Our Lord was meek. But have you, ever, have you ever tried to visualize in your mind his going into the temple and, and turning those table of the money changers upside down? I mean, he, he just tore that place apart. Just because of what was taking place. 
Yes, meekness doesn't, is not synonymous with weakness. But it's a degree of humility. It suppresses wrath. It suppresses ind indignation against those who would harm you. How did the Lord respond when, when he was about to be put to death? Did he fight back? Told Peter, put up your sword. If this was a matter of fighting, I've got legions of angels. Don't need your help. Isaiah, we read this Wednesday night, Isaiah 53. I was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as lamb before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. And see, if we're going to be Christ-like, then that's going to be characteristic of us. And, and that's the idea in this case of meekness. Christ-like attitude. So there's the flea. There's some things that, that we are to, to get away from. You know, and I hate to keep backing up here, but I just can't seem to get off. I can't seem to get a, Roger, help me move on, will you? Um, flee. What does that say about the individual who will try to get just as close to sin as they can get without falling over the edge? You know, I, I think about that in, in, you know, some areas where back, years ago, and of course styles come and go, but you know, when we were battling the short skirt immodest era, what was the question that was asked when you challenged somebody about the length of their skirt? Why well, short's too short? What do they say? How close to sin can I get without committing it? God's people are going to go the other direction, folks. When my son was coming up, of course, that was, uh, you know, long hair on men was the thing that was evident, and you began to challenge, and uh, he never had long hair, not while he was at home. I had too sharp a knife. But, uh, but what was the question? How long is long? That doesn't sound to me like somebody who's really trying to flee and stay as far away from sin as they can stay. It's trying to get up to the edge. Folks, that's dangerous territory. That's dangerous territory. And there are other areas that you can think about where you've heard people say, well, you know, but you, you find that, do we have to attend every service in order to be faithful to God? What's the idea? How close to sin can we get without committing it? You know, God's people are going to want to be together every time they can be together. So in all of these areas, we don't play around, dabble around the edge of sin. We don't wait around the edge hoping that we're not going to, to get caught up in one of those undercurrents. We stay as far away from it as we can. That's the nature of God's people. And so, so when he talks here about fleeing, there's the idea. Here's an area of things to follow. And then in verse 12, what does he say? Fight. Fight. I want to, I think I've got time. I want to read you something that it just, matter of fact, when I read this, it just kind of put me in tears, quite frankly. This is from the um, 1986 Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship. The man who wrote it was uh, Brother Jimmy Steele, who was a, a black brother. So some of the language sounds a little bit that way, you'll understand it. But in, um, in a section, and he was talking about preachers and proper motives and the charge to fight and so forth. He said, many, many, uh, may those of us who are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ... Maintain the determination, the attitude possessed by Lewis Douglas, the son of Frederick Douglas, 
Lewis Douglas had just finished engaging in battle on Morris Island, South Carolina, known as Fort Wagner. That night in 1863, Lewis decided to, to, to drop his sweetheart a line, a note, to let her know how things were there on the front line. In a book titled, In Their Own Words, edited by Milton, Milton Meltzer, 1964, pages 157 159, under the topic of a letter from the front, Lewis wrote to Amelia these words, Dear Amelia, I have been in two fights and am unhurt. I am about to go into another, I believe, tonight. Our men fought well on both occasions. The last was desperate. We charged that terrible battery on Morris Island, known as Fort Wagner, and were repulsed. Defrost of your city is wounded. George Washington is missing. Jacob Carter is missing. Charles Reason wounded. Charles Whiting, Charles Creamer, all wounded. I escaped unhurt from that perfect hell of shot and shell. It was terrible. I need not particularize. The papers will give you a better account than I have time to give. My thoughts are with you often. You are as dear as ever. Be good to remember it as be good to remember it as no doubt you will. As I said before, we are on the eve of another fight, and I am very busy and have just snatched a moment to write you. I must necessarily be brief. Listen to this. Is that the second bell? Should I fall in the next fight killed or wounded, I hope I fall with my face to the foe. Do you think about that? He goes on and he says, let us stand. And, and he goes on to talk about some things. But I thought that was so interesting. If I fall tonight, I hope I fall with my face to the foe. Folks, that's where we need to be as God's people. I was moving too fast for you this morning.